can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, some of the past interviews you can check out, founder of P90X, founder of RX Bar, founder of Atari. They talk about not just the ups, but the downs and the journey. Um, this interview is a little bit different. This is, was for the Process Breakdown podcast that I did. It was so good that I had to release it on Inspired Insider, so stay tuned. Um, and before you get to it, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. What we do is at Rise25, we help B2B businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients, and we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. And the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships, a podcast for me over, over the past 10 years has allowed me to profile others thought leadership in companies and give to them and have them on my podcast and platform. So if you have questions about podcasting, go to rise25.com. You can watch a video. My business partner and I banter like an old married couple. Check out rise25.com. Thanks. Listen to the episode. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, host of the Process Breakdown podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company getting rid of bottlenecks and giving your staff everything they need to be successful at their job. Um, before we get to introducing today's guest, who's world-renowned, he is, uh, in my mind, synonymous with all of those things, actually, David Allen. Um, I'm going to talk about today's sponsor, and the episode is brought to you by Sweet Process. And if you have had team members ask you the same questions over and over again, a uh, tenth time, um, you've spent explaining it's probably your fault and uh, you need to put in a solution. And uh, Sweet Process is a software that makes it drop dead easy to train and onboard new staff and save time with existing staff. And they not only help universities, banks, hospitals, software companies, but actually I found out that first responder government agencies use them in life or death situations to run their operations. So you can use Sweet Process to document all the repetitive tasks that eat up your precious time so you can focus on growing your team and empowering them to do their best work. There's a free 14-day trial with no credit card to go to sweetprocess.com. That's sweet like candy, S-W-E-E-T process.com. And I'm excited for today's guest. I've listened to his book and uh, the new edition of his book. Um, today we have David Allen, who's world renowned for his GTD, Getting Things Done System and Books uh, and Certification. And over 2 million people have been introduced to GTD and discovered the power of clearing their mind, sharpening their focus and accomplishing more with ease and elegance. And he wrote the New York Times bestselling, Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity in 2001 and re-released a new edition in 2015. The book's published in over 28 languages and Time Magazine heralded it as the defining self-help business book of its time. David, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thanks for the invitation. Delighted to be here. You know, there's a couple of ways we can go and, and we're, we'll talk about, you know, some of the workflow, which you've probably talked about uh, until you're red in the face over the years. Um, and I want you to talk about, there's this really cool picture online I found of you holding up the yuppie Bible. So we will definitely talk about that, but I figured we would talk about the origins, um, and what your mentor taught you and start there. Sure. Well, let me back up a little bit, Jeremy. I got into this for, from several different vectors uh, sort of came together. Uh, and one was my interest in maintaining clarity and clear space in my own head. Uh, I had spent time in the martial arts, uh, had a black belt in karate, uh, meditation, spiritual practices, sort of self-exploration stuff. You know, this is Berkeley, 68, 69, 70, you know, so heady time to be there. Um, and basically w was on a path of sort of self-exploration but they weren't paying people to do that. So I had to keep a job. And but I had friends who were starting their own businesses or running their own small companies. And I became a good number two guy to try helping guys out. So I'd walk in and look around and see what they were doing. And, you know, basically see, gee, is there some easier way we can do this? 
you know, I'm just the laziest guy you ever met. So I always look and say, is there some easier way we can get this done? Now they call that process improvement, you know, fancy term. I'm just like, the most like, productive I'm, people I know are lazy in nature because they want to find faster ways to get it done. Sure. Well, <laughs> efficiency and laziness. I mean, I suppose you could, you could, you know, kind of combine those, those two things. Anyway, so I'd walk in and improve their condition and get bored, you know, work. Okay, fine. Then I'd go get bored. And so I'd leave and go get another, you know, uh, number two job. So that's why I had to say, you know, you may have, if you've read my background, that's why I say I had 35 jobs by the time I was 35, you know, just simply because that's, you know, I was just banging around, you know, paying the rent. Uh, but, you know, wasn't stupid and, you know, I like, helped out people and did some good work. So I was a good number two guy. And then one day I discovered they actually pay people to do that. They call them something. So consultant, you know, now I couldn't spell it. Now I are one. So I hung out my shingle, 1981, Allen Associates. And uh, also, given the fact that I like efficiency, I didn't like to have to try to make it up every time I had a new client in terms of how to help them if it wasn't obvious what I could do. Uh, so I... Uh, was, I was hungry for models, or at least a model, or some models that if it wasn't clear what I could do, I could pull this out of my back pocket and walk people through some sort of a model that would improve their condition. So I was hungry for those kinds of techniques, et cetera, in that way. So that was, uh, that I then began to, also just for myself, I like to be clear and stay clear. And as my life was getting a bit more complex and more complicated, I was kind of growing up professionally and career-wise. Uh, I saw how easy it was to, you know, lose focus, lose control myself personally. So I was also very hungry for those kind of techniques for myself. So it turned out that the techniques that I was finding for myself, they worked really, really well. I found some very, very cool stuff and uh, turned around and used them with my clients and produced exactly the same result. More control, more focus, more space to focus on the meaningful stuff, you know, that they wanted to do. Uh, and so... You know, that was working very well. And then somebody in the big corporate world sort of showed up and said, wow, that we, our whole company needs that, you know, that outcome. So you know, he asked me to come in and design a training program around all that. And uh, I found myself thrust into the corporate training world. So that's another long vector that, that took off from there. And that's where the yuppie Bible kind of came from. You know, I was training thousands of people in the, in the corporate world out there. It could have fooled me that I was going to be in the corporate training world. But back to your initial question about the DNA of this, some of the original techniques that I was learning for myself came from a mentor of mine, a man named Dean Acheson, not the famous one, but the, another guy, uh, still a good friend. And he had spent many years uh, as an executive uh, coach and consultant in organizational change. And uh, he and I hooked up together. He sort of took to me and said, gee, David, you're probably going to take this, you know, maybe further than I am. And he kind of took me under his wing. Hmm. And Why did he think couple... that, David? Why did he think you were going to take it further than him? I don't know. Intuition, I guess. Hmm. He's, he, he, didn't, he wasn't particularly, you know, aspirational in terms of mm -hmm. Uh, either what he had learned trying to you know spread it around the world as education wise uh, you know he was just interested in his own own boutique kind of consulting practice and so uh, but he took me under his wing and uh, I, I brought him a good client to begin with so we worked together and then he shared with me a whole lot of what he had learned about organizational change and he shared with me a very powerful model about uh, how to do that it was a five five phase model and one of the things he had discovered was that it was very difficult to get an organization to change and move forward toward where it thought it wanted to go if it had a lot of old business and a lot of incompletions and a lot of unconscious stuff that was kind of hanging around like big barnacles on a ship. He said, you try to get an organization to try to change and move forward when it has a lot of old business that are in, that's incomplete and hanging them up, you know, psychologically and even physically that it's like trying to, you know, pull somebody through quicksand. So he discovered some techniques, especially working particularly with senior executives, CEOs of the companies he was working with. They had really trouble making decisions and they had a lot of old business that was sort of hanging around them and sort of, you know, you know sucking the wind out of their sails. So, you know, he just in his own frustration and working with his own clients, he, he one day just had somebody sit down and just empty everything that was on their mind any old business, any incompletions, any projects that hadn't been finished, any old business at, at all. And, you know, started to, you know, sort of empty, do what now we call the mind sweep, 
you know, in getting things done. Like literally everything they had their attention on, personal, professional, anything they were willing to share, just get it out of their head. Write it on a single piece of paper. Buy cat food, hire a vice president, uh, research a new XYZ, whatever it was. Uh, and then he had them take that big pile of stuff they got out of their head and pick up one them one at a time and say, what's the next action I would need to take to move the needle on this toward mm. closure? Mm. And he had them make the next action decisions. And he did that process with me. I mean, I, my act was pretty well together. I, I, I thought I was pretty well organized and focused, but he said, David, why don't let, let me show you what, what this is like. So he sat me down and had me do that process. And I went, oh my God, you know, I'm dumping stuff out of my head I didn't even know was in there. And then he had me go through that stack one at a time and make the next action decision about it. And he had a whole process about once I made the action decision, if I could do it in two minutes, I should just do it right then. If I could delegate it, there is a little memo, a little paper-based memo. This was before even paper planners. I mean, this is 1981, 82, right? And so we, all this was just on paper. It was low tech, but very, very powerful. It made sure I had an end basket, made sure I had a place to throw the stuff that had my attention, made sure that I had an out basket that I could put the stuff if I was delegating or it needed to go out somewhere, making sure I had a good filing system to park the stuff that I just needed to reference. So it was low tech, but extremely practical and extremely powerful. And what a surprise, you know, big duh. This sounds like very basic stuff, but most people aren't even close to doing what that process really is. And so I literally then spent hundreds of hours with Dean walking through. As soon as we'd work with the CEO, we had to run fast and work with all the direct reports because the CEO, as we were doing this, was just out suddenly unloading tons of stuff. And there, all the people, <laughs> the direct reports are going, oh my God, what is all this, you know? Well, the boss had been the bottleneck, you know? Yeah. So we just uncorked that. And so we would just run through the whole organization to make sure everybody, you know, had the same process of keeping the head cleared, had an in basket, had a place to grab all the stuff and surface a lot of the old business, actually all the old business and make next action decisions and move the needle on them, either throw it away or file it away or let's get, let's, let's, let's engage with it appropriately. Yeah. And so that was very, very powerful. And that was just his initial problem prop process so that then you could take the senior team and focus on purpose and vision and what's the vision of the company and then redo a reorg based upon outputs and based upon, you know, yada, yada. And I, you know, very powerful model in terms of just organizational change that I did for many years, worked with a number of clients just as a consultant doing that kind of stuff. But the funny thing, Jeremy, was that, that just that first process solved 90% of the presenting issues. <laughs> it was all you had to do was surface. Well, wait a minute. What's got anybody's attention in the organization and then find out how do I un mm. un unstick that and the organization almost organically by itself starts to move, starts to change. You free up all kinds of tons of energy that then you can then, then use then, you know, if you've got a good process to then focus that released energy toward whatever the new direction is, very powerful stuff. Anyway, that's, that was, you know, two years of, you know, two to three years of working very closely with Dean and doing then my own work, you know, in that regard and finding out that just that first process of capturing and clarifying what was on people's mind and what they had attention on just became the core of a whole lot of what my consulting practice was. And that became the core element when a corporation asked me to design a whole training around this. It really, you know, because it really is, you know, and, and, this can, you can take this at a, at a mundane level, but also pretty sublime level. It's really, you know, what our work here is about completion and creation, right? You're here to finish what you put in motion and, you know, whether you like it or not, it's around you. You, you know, you, you can't, you, know, you can fool me, but not yourself in terms of commitments you've made with yourself. And then, you know, then where are you parking? Where are you pointing your creative energy once you free it up? And so those two things, you can expand that, you can contract it down to work with a seven-year-old. We're, we're teaching kids this stuff, you know, and then uh, you can take it all the way up to the most sophisticated, busiest people on the planet. Cause I've worked, I spent thousands of hours, literally desk side working with them, you know, doing this kind of stuff, you know, very powerful. And it's kind yeah. of a duh, you yeah. know, and when you think about it, the, the, the interesting thing is the most powerful thing is the thought process that this installs outcome and action. You know, <laughs> the keys to getting things done is, first of all, what does done mean? And what does doing look like? Mm -hmm. Where does that happen? Mm -hmm. But what does done mean? Very few people are really clear about what that is. 
what is the project you've got now? You, this thing that's got your attention, why has it got your attention? Uh, I don't like this. Well, what would you like to have true? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So what's the project? What's the outcome you're committed to actually move on right now? What, how, how would you like to feel? What would you like to produce? What's the out, desired outcome? And by the way, if you had nothing else to do but that, what would you do? Where would you go physically? Where would you put your attention right now? If you had nothing else to do, what's the very next action step you would need to take? And those two things, and by the way, when I say next action, I mean as granular as, you know, send an email, surf the web, talk to your life partner, uh, you know, draft a, a document, uh, you know, what, pick up the phone, you know, what, whatever the next physical visible thing I'd see you do, it has to be that granular, otherwise you haven't finished your thinking. And the thing is still spinning inside your psyche. So those, that was basic stuff that I began to not only learn, but then spend hundreds and then thousands of hours working people one-on-one, -on -one, just applying that thought process and seeing, interestingly enough, how rare it was to find anybody who actually had built that in as a habit. Most people work, but they haven't defined the, the art of work. And the art of work, you know, the late, great Peter Drucker would tell everybody who you know, has to think about what they're doing that their biggest job is figuring out what your work actually is. The mail that comes in your mailbox still doesn't label itself as junk mail. <laughs> you have to do that. You actually have to think. I love junk mail, but yeah. <laughs> I know, me too. I, I found some of the coolest things in the world from junk mail. It's not junk mail then. Yeah. So it's only junk mail once you make the decision that I don't need that. Uh, that it's not a someday maybe even. Oh, well, that's a cool brochure. I might want to go there somewhere once the virus is over. You know, yeah. or whatever. You know, so, so yeah, some, so some of these basics I began to explore a long time ago. And then, you know, I began to refine that a lot of my consulting turned into coaching actually for mid to senior level executives in these companies where I was being brought in to do a lot of the training about this stuff because they wanted hands on desk side one on one, you know, time with me to actually implement it themselves. So it wasn't so much coaching like, uh, let's spend a year together, though I, I, uh, it has morphed over the years into sometimes I've done that with a client, but for the most part, it was just like, Hey, let me take you by the hand and walk you in, in implement this methodology. Uh, That's where the certification and, comes in. People can now hire certified, your certified partners. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So learning to coach, uh, you know, coaching really well, which I learned first from Dean, my, my first mentor. And then, you know, we built, you know, I, I and then I, wound up, I, I wasn't particularly aspirational or entrepreneurial myself, but just wound up having a, a bit of a boutique kind of training and coaching company uh, with just enough uh, of my own coaches and trainers to keep up with the demand that was just, uh, I never marketed anything. It was just pick up the phone. It was all uh, referral. Mm. And so wound up, you know, <laughs> fast forward, you know, over the next 30 years spending, you know, thousands of hours, quite literally one-on-one -on -one desk side with some of the best and brightest folks you'd ever meet and hundreds of thousands of people going through trainings that both I did as well as certified, you know, coaches and trainers, you know, in our company. So there's a very short, short yeah. version of a no, very long it. story, Jeremy. So, yeah, you know what? I hate to give you more work, David, but, um, <laughs> I would love to see your next book. Um, Boss is the bottleneck, and uh, you talk about the the craziest stories that kind of like cleaning up organizations, almost like a, a chicken soup for the soul for like, you know, cleaning up all the stories like dumped out of your head of okay, we went into this, and here's some of the stuff we did, type of uh, type of thing. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, it's funny people have often asked me that. Oh, by the way, just interesting, serendipitously, Jack Canfield and I, you know, shared the stage together, sort of as personal growth trainers back in the back in the late 70s and, and, and early 80s. So, you know, Jack knows all this stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, uh, the, the people have often asked, well, what are some of the most interesting or strange or different things you've ever run across? Not much. It's all pretty much the same. I wasn't going to ask strange, but I would say most chaotic. Do you remember a, like one of those, wow, I mean, not necessarily a hoarder situation, but a crazy, just a chaotic organization and what, no? No, relative to what I have as a reference point in terms of clean and clear 
space, mm. everybody's chaotic. Everybody's in chaos. And interestingly, it's kind of like the better you, the, the better you are, the more interesting and sublime the chaos is. See, let me, let, me, let me boost this up a little bit. If you don't pay attention to what has your attention, it'll take more of your attention than it deserves. And once you handle what has your attention, you'll find out what really has your attention. Which, by the way, once you then appropriately engage with, opens you up to find out what really has your attention. So it's a big onion to unpeel. So just because somebody feels and looks and maybe maybe looks like they're organized and in control, there's multiple levels there that may not be true, or that, 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 that they need to explore. As a matter of fact, the more sophisticated and mature people are, the more subtle and sublime the chaos is internally. Mm. Like, what am I really doing with my life now that I'm 55? You know, wow, I've just graduated and they just handed me this new job. Do I really want that? So out of control can look like a lot of different things. It doesn't, they don't look out of control. As a matter mm. of fact, the strange paradox about this, Jeremy, is that the, well, the real strange paradox is the people most attracted to this are the people who need it the least. They're already the most productive, aspirational, uh, positively focused, future focused kind of folks. It's just they've, they've come up to the limit of their own ability to be able to keep expanding their ability to do good stuff. They're already doing good stuff that got them to the successful thing, but they just, they've just hit the limit. And they know, because they already know the value of system, that's what got them there. They already know that they can produce good stuff because they're already doing that. They just know they're limited now. And they, they want more. They want to be able to expand more. And expand more, expand more does not necessarily mean work harder or even produce more physical results. It may be expand more called get more time with my kids or expand more, be able to be of greater service to people around me or expand more to be more of a mentor and a servant leader, you know, in the organization that I'm working in. So expansion can look or sound like a lot of things. Hmm. I've had to deal with the fact that the word productivity has got a lot of baggage around it because it kind of sounds like work harder, sweat more, you know, do more. Right. And everybody's already kind of up to here. So, uh, and yeah, sometimes it, it is about getting more done, you know, physically done because a lot of people are quite inefficient in terms of the stuff they're getting done. And so, uh, but, but many times it's more like improving the quality of what you're getting done and how you're moving through, you know, the commitments and how you engage with life. I changed the it, title now then it's called expand more. And then the boss is the bottleneck is the subtitle. So yeah, no, <laughs> that's very, that's very, very creative. Um, the boss, well, the, the, another, another maybe title of the book, but it actually is just a, a reframe of how you think about what getting things done is, is not mm -hmm. as much about getting things done as, as it is about being appropriately engaged with your life. Mm -hmm. Are you appropriately engaged with your health? Are you appropriately engaged with your cat? Are you appropriately engaged with your job? Are you appropriately engaged with your desk? Are you appropriately engaged with your desk drawer? <laughs> you know? And the, the appropriate engagement doesn't mean that you're, that you're finished. That doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're doing everything about it. It just means that you're fine with the way it is and how you are currently relating to it. So that's why a lot of the key of getting things done and a lot of the way our coaches and our trainers work with people is to find out what has your attention. Because there's an usually, usually, I'd say 95% of the time, things are on your mind because you're not yet appropriately engaged with them. That is, it's on your mind because there's some part of you still knows you, there's some decision about it you need to make or you need to park the results in some sort of trusted place that you figure you are the right person will see at the right time in the right context. Because then it won't be on your mind because you've now externalized your commitment into an external system that's trusted. And the mind is then freed up to do what it does best, which is you know make good strategic intuitive judgments. The mind did not evolve to remember or remind. It's a crappy office. And that's one of the biggest problems, and that's where a lot of the at least subliminal stress is coming from for a lot of people is they're trying to use their head as their office. They're trying to use their head to remember, remind, prioritize, and manage relationships between a whole lot of commitments and a whole lot of things out there, personal and professional. 
And then, you know, I discovered this over 30 years ago, but the cognitive scientists in the last 10 years or 15 years have now discovered and proven that the number of things you can hold just in your psyche and still manage it appropriately in terms of remembering, reminding, and managing the relationships and prioritizing is four. Hmm. I just interviewed Daniel Levitin not long ago, his new book on successful, successful aging, great book. And Daniel wrote The Organized Mind. I mean, he's a deep cognitive science researcher, McGill University and, and other places. And I mentioned to Dan, uh, you know, I said four things. He said, David, wrong. I said, wrong. <laughs> I said, he said, two. I said, two. He said, yeah. It's two. Maybe that's since WhatsApp and since whatever. I don't know. But, you know, his point of view was the, the brain is just really, it, it just will get fried. And that's what a lot of people are dealing with. And that's what a lot of just my methodology was. I discovered the algorithm about how do you get stuff off your attention without having to finish it. But that's not free. You don't get there by drinking or meditating. I mean, those are fine things to do. They just they may numb your head or let you leave your head. But, uh, you know, if, if in the world that you're in, if you want to have a clear head, cooking spaghetti or spending time with your kids or, you know, writing the business plan or whatever it is you want to do, you've got to then deal with the things that you've committed to. And most people are just committed to a whole lot more things than they realize. Yeah. I think I, I, when I think of getting things done, I think of organization, organizational psychology meets Confucius. Something like that. Okay. Yeah, well, there's a whole lot to that. I mean, I, I, I really have loved, actually, since high school, I, you know, I read a lot of Zen, and I'm a big, big fan of the Sufi stuff. And I love that sort of the, the min, minimalist, you know, sort of uh, thinking, you know, style, if you will. Uh, and so, and, you know, the, 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 the efficiency and the effectiveness of, of a lot of those ancient philosophies are, you know, quite sublime. And people say, gee, David, well, did you, did all this come from Zen? I say, no, it just, it, you know, it sort of discovered the same stuff I discovered. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, we mentioned a few things, um, you know, in sort of the beginning parts of the GTD workflow. So you talked about the capture, the clarify. Would you consider what you talked about? And before we go there, you mentioned, you know, you can do this with seven-year-olds. You could do this with the top CEO executives. It doesn't matter. And I was actually with my daughter the other day, she's eight, and we set up a Trello board, um, you know, uh, basically motiv motivated by and inspired by getting things done. And uh, we had a brain dump column, a to-do column, a doing column, and a done column, because we had stuff we wanted to do yesterday. And so we brain dumped everything, and then we started moving it. But she had a clarification for me, and she wanted a fun stuff column, which preceded the to-do column. So we had to do the fun stuff, move the brain dump stuff to the fun stuff, do that first, and then the to-do. So thank you for that. Uh, so <laughs> getting her started on, you know, getting stuff out of her head so you could just like, you know, uh, clear your mind a little bit to start. Um, so I think the first two things, the, the capture and the clarify, um, are those two that you just mentioned um, where, where did that, where does that fall into what you just talked about? And then maybe just mention, you know, we have the organize, reflect and engage also. Mm -hmm. Well, capture and clarify, those are extremely powerful. I mean, it's really a holistic model, the five yeah. steps, if you really want to sort of stay clear, uh, and stay in control and focused. Uh, and by the way, I didn't make up those five steps. I recognized them. So, you know, and, but they're very different steps. It's a very different thing for you and your daughter to capture the stuff that might have your attention that you might want to do something about versus the decision to then what specifically do I want to do and where does that go? Which then, you know, morphs to the, to the third stage, which is where does it go? You know, which column do I put it in? That's called organize. Mm -hmm. So once you've determined what it, what this means, Oh, that's a fun thing. Oh, that's a kind of a work thing. Then fine. Where do you put fun stuff? Where do you put work stuff? Mm. So that when you're into fun mode, you're not bothered by your work stuff. And when you're in work mode, you're not bothered by your fun stuff. Big duh. Well, out, <laughs> of the, out of the mouths of babes, right? You know, and even to that point, uh, the fact that most people have not externalized all the stuff that has their attention. One parent several years ago, you know, had a kid that just never cleaned his room. 
So he, he, his dad kind of got GTD and said, okay, let me see if we can play this game. So what he did was instead of just telling the kid, go clean your room, he said, hey, hey, hey let's play a game. Let's go find all the stuff that's not where, where it ultimately belongs. Let's play the game. Let's see how many things we can find that aren't where they would ultimately should be. Say, okay, go. And so he had a big box and they, they just went all around and found all the stuff and they put it in a big box. Cool. Okay, now the second part of the game is let's take each one of these things one at a time, pick it up and see where does it go? Let's see how fast we can do that. Okay, pick it up. That goes over there. Bang. Hey, we're almost at the bottom. Go, keep going. The kid wound up cleaning his room on a regular basis, right? He got the game. Guess what? You tell a kid to clean their room, their psyche is so creative and so fast, they're thinking of how many things they're going to have to decide, how many things they're going to have to, decisions they're going to make. Oh my God, they just blow a fuse. That's why most adults resist this process as well. It's like, oh my God, sit down and think and write down everything that's got my attention. Oh my God, don't ask me to do that. Thing. And then people get mad at me for their list. I'm going, I'm sorry, that ain't my list. It's yours. You can decide where you want to keep track of it. But kind of out of the mouths of babes, interestingly enough, you know, that the model of, wow, now I can clean my room as a game simply because I got the capture, clarify steps as individual and discrete practices that need to be done sort of in cooperation and coordinate, in coordination with each other. And of course, he included this sort of step three, which is organized once they decided, oh, that's that toy and those toys go over there. This is a fun thing that goes in the fun column. That's the organized step. Put stuff where it goes. So you don't have fun stuff mixed up with the other stuff because then you start to go numb to the pile. So then organize, organize just simply means once you've decided what this is and if you can't finish it in the moment, stick it somewhere so you don't have to keep rethinking what it means or what you need to do with it when you decide to engage with it. And then step four says look at the piles. <laughs> look at the column. Hey, you want to have fun? Go look at that. That's the reflect process. We go, okay, let me step back a little bit and take a look at the inventory of the things that I've actually uncovered. And then step five simply says, okay, now, now let me go have fun. Let me go do that thing. Let me engage now. But now what I've done, because I've captured and clarified and organized it all and stepped back and reviewed from a little higher perspective on the whole thing, I'm now, now I'm making a trusted choice about how I'm engaging my activity and my focus. So it's true for a seven-year-old, it's true for a 70-year-old, it's true for the CEO of a, of a global corporation, it's true for your stay-at-home dad, it's true for anybody. You know, but again, these you're not born doing this. If you were, I did had to get another, have to get another job. <laughs> you know? So what was the, why, what made you decide to release another edition of Getting Things Done? Well, the model is, is, is eternal. I mean, you know, a hundred years from now, or whenever we fly to Jupiter, you still need an in-basket. You're still going to have to capture stuff that has your attention. You're still going to have to decide the next action on it. You're still going to have to have some system that's going to organize a reminder of it, you know, so you can engage with the right thing at the right time. Well, so it's an eternal model. It has been since I sort of uncovered it, discovered it, and formatted it, if you will. I really framed it, I guess, more consciously than most people were aware of. That's supposed the value of what I brought to the table was to be able to frame the model. Uh, so that didn't really change. Uh, I, a little deeper understanding 15 years later of what these, I, you know, you may have noticed I changed some of the wording a little bit, like instead of collect, it's capture. Instead of process, it's clarify. Instead of review, it's reflect. Because those things represent a more global uh, phenomenon of this model. Because it, it you know, the as opposed to just sort of this mechanical, let me just deal with the stuff that I've already produced that's out there and let me just kind of get it in place. It, it works that way too. But this is actually a bit more expansive. So my vocabulary expanded to include the more sublime aspects, I think, of what the model really does and, 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 and produces. And for the most part, the audience changed a ton. See, when this was first written, you know, it took four years to write it. it. started in 97 and we produced, you know, got on the shelves in 2001. This was really targeted for the fast track professional in the U.S. They were the people that were the first kind of experience that tsunami of email and all the inputs and the digital, you know, flood of, of stuff and fast change going on in their organizations. 
And so they were the hungriest, essentially, for this model to kind of stay up, stay afloat amidst all of that. And they were, you know, part. Of, they were the people that were most interested in paying us to bring this stuff to them. You know, so th so the first book was, you know, I got a suit and tie, and that's kind of, you know, looks, you know, it's targeted for that audience and a lot of the vocabulary and a lot of the the examples because that that's where a lot of my experience came from was that corporate world, and the, you know, even though I worked a lot with you know, smaller companies and startups and entrepreneurs. But that was, you know, the bulk of my time was spent in the, in the big corporate environment out there. But I knew even back then that this worked for students, it worked for the clergy, it worked for sole proprietors, it worked for physicians, it worked for attorneys, it worked for anybody who's got a busy life. You know, I've, I'd seen it and it worked with people to, to, to watch how powerful it was. So 15 years later, well, let's say back in 2001, I'd say maybe in an organization, 10% of the people really, really, really needed this. Now, 95% of the people in organizations need it because, you know, people don't have time to hold people's hands. People, you know, have to then sort of be their own entrepreneurs, be their own executives, no matter what level they're at in the organization, because things are moving so fast and they have to stay in control of themselves. So a lot of it was just the expansion of the audience uh, to include, you know, a lot more you know, people in, in, in a lot of other different kind of professions and context, you know, and how it, in that way. And also included, as you know, in the, one of the last chapters, a, a lot of the cognitive science stuff that has shown up since the first edition was written. It basically just validates, you know, this model. You know, Dave, what are ways um, that people can engage with getting things done? They can get the books. Um, you have a certification program. Um, and I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about uh, the workbook. Yeah, well, let me just give a, <laughs> let me give a kind of a big um, confession right here, Jeremy, and that is I am not a really good trainer. I'm certainly not a good instructional designer. Uh, you know, I'm a good presenter, and I was really more of a researcher and an educator than anything else, but I didn't know really how to make this stick for people. I just knew what I discovered and the model work. And so I wrote the book really as a manual in case I got run over by a bus. It took me 20 years to figure out what I'd figured out and then nobody else seemed to have figured it out that way and that it was bulletproof because it, I, it had been tested and proven in the toughest environments you could imagine and went viral inside of those environments. So I knew this really, really worked. So I said, you know, I had some good coaching from some good friends that said, write the book. Ah, oh, write the book. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> so that was an agonizing process. Amazing how stressful it was to write a book about stress free productivity. Uh, but <laughs> so that said, um, you know, as the book became quite successful and got translated around the world and started to spread around the world and people knocking on our door from around the world, David, can, can I be a GTD coach? Can I, can I distribute this in, in Italy? Can I do this in China? Can I do this in whatever? And, you know, I didn't, as I say, that was bigger gum than I knew how to chew, how to build some sort of global model about this. And so we decided, okay, well, let's, let's turn our focus to what can we do because it's such great stuff. Let's not hold it back from the world. So the last 10 or 15 years, our focus strategically has been how do we scale this? How do we build a, a global model for this? And how do we create an education that, that actually sticks? Because it's a lot of stuff. You know, come on, if you listen to my seven and a half hours on the audio, that's a lot of stuff to go implement. Unless you're already really close anyway, uh, it could be quite daunting. So, you know, a lot of the coaching that we've got really good coaching over the last 10 years from some of the best instructional designers in the world, really. And it's, a lot of it's about simplify, not, not step down the methodology, but simplify the, the ease and lower the barrier of entry for people to get involved with this and actually start to do the behaviors themselves. That's a, kind of the, the big backstory to then ultimately we wrote, we, we just produced the getting things done workbook, which is like take the 10 steps to actually implement this. So you don't have to go try to figure that out through the book. You could, but this makes it a lot easier and it's got QR codes. So if you put your phone on that, but you'll see a little video of me talking about what you just read. And so it makes it a lot, a lot easier, I think, for people to engage with it. So that's why. That's why yes. the workbook. So I wish you would have told me that a week ago. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I love the book. Um, and so is it on gettingthings.com? Uh, gettingthingsdone.com? Gettingthingsdone.com. Well, you'll, if you go to gettingthingsdone.com, that's our, our, our website. 
uh, we don't sell books anymore. We actually don't do coaching and training ourselves anymore because we've now, li- you know, we've now licensed partners all around the world and licensed, uh, you know, pretty rigorous training that we've licensed, certified uh, licensed trainers and coaches to actually deliver this work like we do it, you know, up to our level of quality. And the book you just have to get from it. Please use, go get it from your local bookstore. You know, come on, I love to support local bookstores. So, but you can get it from anywhere that good books are sold. So yeah. that, and also last year we produced Getting Things Done for Teens. So, uh, you know, over the years, parents kept banging on our door saying, oh my God, how do I get this to my kid? Or, or gee, I wish I would learned this when I was 15. Yeah, me too. And so, you know, I co-wrote that with uh, two parents, you know, who were big GTDers and and really good at this. One of them was, uh, you know, uh, a key executive in our company. And the other co-author was still a public school teacher in Minneapolis uh, who's teaching his kids. That's why I say we know it works for seven, eight, nine-year-olds because, you know, he's been teaching them for two or three years, you know, this stuff and has his own model of how he does that. So that's what's happened. I, you know, I suppose you know, since the the success of the book is now, how do we distribute it to the audience that really can use it? How do we distribute it around the world? Trying to figure that out. So, you know, still got a lot lot ahead of us. Can they get it on your website, the workbook? Where do they get the workbook? No, same thing. They can go to the bookstore. You go to Amazon, go to anywhere. Oh, you can get the workbook at the bookstore too? Yeah. All right. Getting things done, the getting things done workbook. Okay, nice. But that's a, you know, it's in the same, it's kind of in the same model as there was the seven habits workbook. There was the, you know, any of the really good, you know, business books that were quite successful. Uh, many of them produced a workbook afterwards to make it easier for people to, to play and engage. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about the yuppie Bible a little bit. There's a really cool picture online um, of you <laughs> holding up this huge book. I, I think when I was reading it, it dates to 1985 and it's the, subtitles roll out to large corporate client in the US and it's you holding this huge yeah. book. What, well, that was uh, McDonnell Douglas. I mean, I, interestingly, the, the, the corporation that, that brought me in to begin with that asked me to take the stuff that I was doing and design a seminar and training around it was Lockheed, the head of human resources there. And he became a huge champion of my stuff. And then he moved over to McDonnell Douglas and then he brought me over to McDonnell Douglas. And I wound up training literally thousands of engineers and people at McDonnell Douglas. And so, you know, at one point they were having some sort of a celebration and they invited me to some big dinner or whatever, big surprise to me. And, you know, back then, you know, there was the idea of the yuppies, the the young and up and coming or whatever yuppies stood, (laughs) whatever yuppies stood for. And they brought me up on stage and then they made, they, of course, these engineers at McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis had manufactured this huge, you know, copy of this black, book because at the time we were using uh when I, when we were doing training we were actually including the best per pa- paper planner uh in the world uh we had discovered the best one back then paper planners had just kind of shown up but we found the best one and so you know as we were doing the trainings we actually included that it was called time system uh, out of denmark it was called time design in the U.S. because there was already a time system, you know, copyrighted in the U.S. So I've had to change the name, but we included that. And it was a very classy, still a very classy, uh, graphically one of the best designed paper planners in the world. I used it for 20 years. It's a great tool. And so we included that. So that's why, you know, so they, they just made this huge, big black model of this, of this mm. paper planner because people all around McDonald Douglas were walking around with this black book, you know, after they'd been to my training. And so that's, that's where that came from. Nice. It was very, very fun. Um, David, first of all, thank you. I, I have one last question um, before I ask it. Everyone should check out gettingthingsdone.com and um, the books on in your local bookstore, Amazon or whatever. I, I prefer Audible, so I have it on Audible. But um, before I ask my last question, I guess my second last question is what's next for you? What, what, is, what are you focused on and working on? Well, a lot of what I've been doing for the last two or three years and particularly and keep doing is supporting a lot of our new licensees because we've, you know, we've wound up with a program both in the U.S. We've partnered with Vital Smarts in the U.S., fabulous company, and they're certifying their, the, the trainers for the U.S. and Canada. And then outside of that, uh, we've partnered with a company called SM Covey. Actually, that's David Covey, who is Stephen's son. And mm-hmm. Stefan Mardix, they had, they had come from Franklin Covey, and they built a sort of global network there. And so they took me by the hand and said, "Okay, David, we you know 
let's let's partner together and we'll we'll help you do that so they built their global network we're now officially in about 73 countries i think where you, you can see that if you go onto our website and look at training you can just see all the different countries that are that deliver our training so a lot of what i've been doing in the last two or three years is is when we have a new licensee once they kind of get their feet on the ground I show up for a week and do press and sort of let the world know these guys have my imprimatur and, you know, this is mm. the real folks. Because there are a lot of GTD pirates out there and had been. You know, people read the book and say, oh, I can do this. And so it was kind of disturbing the brand and the quality. You know, so we, a lot of our work now is is more support of the licensees, you know, who, who are now doing great work and a fabulous network of people out there. Some of the coolest folks you, you'd ever meet. Uh, one of the reasons I'm in Amsterdam, aside from the fact that we, we love the city, we wanted to move to Europe anyway, uh, it's much more the center of the world than, you know, than Santa Barbara was where I, where I came from, which is also a lovely place. But, you know, in the last six to nine months, I've been in Moscow, I've been in Kiev, I've been in Tel Aviv, I've been in Athens. Um, and uh, so that's a lot of what I'm doing. You can and get so to now all the European I'm, countries. You can get all over Europe much easier, obviously, for an Amsterdam than if you're oh, in Santa yeah, Barbara. Oh, yeah, it's much more the center of the world. I mean, it's, it's impossible to fly into Santa Barbara. I mean, not impossible, but it's like definitely. Well, yeah. So <laughs> I could see why. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky business. Yeah, for sure. Um, my last question um, is, I'm, I'm curious of your favorite books of all time, business and or otherwise. You know, I go from sort of favorite book to favorite book to favorite mm -hmm. book. And so I, it's kind of hard you to, to back choose one. Yeah. All... Any, any ones that have influenced you, I guess you could say. Uh, so one of the, one of the best recent ones uh, is called the antidote. Oliver Berkman. He's the Brit. He's actually a GTD or two. Uh, and uh, I think the subtitle, uh, uh, do I have it here? Um, not on my shelf. The subtitle is "Happiness for People Who Can't Stand uh, Positive Thinking," <laughs> and it's really, really good. I, my wife, you know, who, who seldom laughs out loud when she's reading, was just kept laughing out loud. He's a great writer. He's he did it really well, and uh, it's a lot of it is about. Um, well, he he actually goes into into uh, something that I didn't really. Uh, uh, understand as as much as I as I do now uh, of the the not the sophist but the um, oh, who were the sort of the ascetics of the Greeks the the Stoics yeah so he explains a lot about Stoicism because we, we all think that that's just big asceticism hard work you know got to stop all that and it's not wasn't really that at all at a more much more subtle level. It actually has a tie, big tie-in with GTD in that it's a lot about the acceptance of current reality as opposed to, yeah, yeah, happy, happy, da, 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 don't have any negative thoughts. No, have whatever thoughts you have. And a big acceptance of current reality is actually required if you want to move forward appropriately. And so a whole lot of what getting things done is about is an acceptance of the current reality. What are all the commitments you've actually got? And as opposed to trying to ignore those or trying to only have positive thoughts and only think about the things you want to do, but still not deal with this, the realities that you're dealing with. And right now, especially with the pandemic going on, that's one of my biggest advice, you know, the, one of the most important things to advise people about right now is you better get a good grip on what current reality really is for you. How much money do you have? How long can you go before you have to change something? What's going on? You know, how do you feel? What's, you know, what's up? It, 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 basically it's saying life life is not necessarily fun it's always a challenge and you wouldn't grow if you didn't have challenges and so you actually don't have to like your life to get it off your mind and to appropriately engage with it so it was a big validation of that a very well written very fun and i think it's a really good sort of a wake-up call and probably especially now with what's going on in the world i think it'd be a great book for for people to read so oliver berkman the antidote uh great you know a, a great book Great book to read, and the you know it, it, current reality. And I could I could spin a lot about that. It, if you know if you pick up a map or look at your GPS or whatever, what's the first what's the, what's the first thing you look at if you want to go somewhere? Where you are. If you don't know where you are, even if you even if you know where you're going, you don't know whether to turn right or left. 
So you need to know where you are. And then of course, and this you know, comes back to outcome and action. Again, the old sort of, sort of the fundamental GTD thought process. Okay, where are you, what do you want to have true now? What's true now? What would you like to have true instead of this if you want this different? And being able to sort of get in the driver's seat of your life is a whole lot of, I think, what the essence of getting things done really is. And why it, so many people, even though it looks fairly simple and highly practical, uh, a lot of people have quite transformative experiences when they start to apply it. You know, I should never say last question, David, but um, <laughs> it brings up, um, I want to know your I never believe. I know, by the way, Jeremy, I never believe anybody who ever says this, here's my last yeah, question. Yeah, exactly. You shouldn't. Um, <laughs> because you brought something up that I have a note to ask about is your wife's influence on the company. My wife's influence on the company. Well, she's been, she, she met me in a seminar I was delivering you know, 35 years ago because her company required people to go to my seminar. <laughs> so she met me there. And then she wound up working for the boutique kind of consulting and training company that we had in, in Los Angeles. And, you know, we were married to different people at different times, but things change. And uh, so one day she asked me out, you know, she was divorced and I was divorced and she asked me out for a date and it's like, oh my God, what do I do with that? Yeah. So anyway, so, so she's been working with me and so she's been working in the company. She was actually one of the first people to train our coaches. Mm. So she got trained, you know, by Dean and, and, and me and was very similar, very in there. So we, she'd been shoulder to shoulder with me for, well, we, I guess even before we were married, that was like probably three years before that. And then we'll be married 29 years come mm. September. So, so she's been doing this work for 30, 30, something years. So she's really a lot of the backbone, you know, the, the, the power behind the throne, if you will. And a lot of her work is the, 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 the yeoman's task of getting all the materials and graphics and all the support material and making sure the quality control and all, all of that stuff. You know, I'm kind of out there, the Tada guy, you know, but she's the one who really, you know, makes sure that, you know, Doing all, that all stuff the real works. work. No, I'm just kidding. The real work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So she's been a great partner. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you've done for, for me and everyone else who follows the getting things done uh, methodology and workflow and everyone should go to gettingthingsdone.com. Check out everything that they have going on. And I want to be the first one, you know, David, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Jeremy, thanks for the invitation. It's been fun. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand.